Okay class, uh, nice work on the axial skeleton. Now we go on to the appendicular skeleton, which is the pectoral girdle, the upper extremity, the pelvis, and the lower extremity. So uh, the appendicular skeleton consists of the upper and lower limbs, the bones of the hands and feet, and the bones that anchor the limbs to the axial skeleton. So the axial skeleton forms the central axis of the body and consists of the skull, vertebrae, column, and thoracic cage. The appendicular skeleton consists of the pectoral and pelvic girdles, the limb bones, and the bones of the hands and the feet. And we'll dive into the details. So we'll start with the clavicle. So the clavicle is S-shaped. Okay, that's the sternal end. This is the acromial end. So this would be a right clavicle. Okay, so it goes out and then in, so you can feel it on yourself. It goes out and then in. It's easily palpated, it braces the shoulder, but it's also the most commonly fractured bone. Yep, that would be a fracture of the collarbone. This is what snowboarding, again, snowboarding. Okay, the pectoral girdles consist of the clavicle and the scapula, which serve to attach the upper limb to the sternum of the axial skeleton. So really, you have a, only one true attachment to your body, which would be through the clavicle, because the scapula doesn't really attach. It's held there for muscles and ligaments. And then, so your upper extremity, the only true attachment it has to your axial skeleton is through this little bone called the clavicle. So here's the scapula. This is a right scapula because the head of the humerus will attach right here. So here's the superior border, the medial border, meaning closest to the spinal column. Here's the subscapular fossa. Here's the lateral border. This would be near your axillary region or AKA your armpit. Okay. Here's the glenoid cavity. Here's the coracoid process. Here's the acromion. Okay. So you definitely need to know all these parts superior medial lateral borders the acromion articulates articulate meaning joins with the clavicle so right here is where the clavicle joins via ligaments the coronary process for biceps attachment so the biceps attaches here and the glenoid cavity socket for the humerus so again here's a different view here's your anterior view of the right posterior view of the right so the supraspinatus fossa infraspinatus fossa. So the scapula, if you look right here, which are your shoulder blades, lies over ribs two through seven, superior and inferior angles, spine, ridge on the posterior surface. The chromium is the apex, supraspinatus fossa here, and the infraspinatus fossa here. And even scapulas break. Look at that. That's a pretty gnarly fracture. This is skiing. As you notice, a common theme that I've shown you a lot of fractures via snowboarding and skiing. If you still do that, you got to be so careful. Okay, here's the humerus, which is technically what you would call your shoulder. So the proximal end, remember what proximal means, closest to the body. It has the head for the glenoid, and it has the intertrabricular sulcus for the biceps tendon, which would be right here. Distal end, furthest from the body, has a capitulum for the radius, so the radius is lateral. Trochlea for the ulna, here's the trochlea, so the ulna would articulate here. And then olecranon fossa posteriorly, which is a deep posterior pit, which is your elbow, like not what you would call your elbow. When you touch your elbow, that's what you're touching, is the olecranon process, which fits in the olecranon fossa. Here's the humerus and the elbow joint. Definitely, this is on your list of things to know. Anatomical neck, greater tubercle, there's a surgical neck. Okay. Intertubricular groove, deltoid tuberosity, which is where the deltoid inserts. The body, which is the shaft. Again, we talked about capitulum. You're probably wondering why this is called the surgical neck, right? But Actually, this is the most common uh, site for fractures when someone falls or has an injury. And the axillary nerve is here, and so are actually a few blood vessels, the 
circumflex uh, artery is also here. So it's a very dangerous place to get a fracture, but it's the most common place. So sometimes they do surgery, sometimes they don't. It just all depends on the displacement. Now you have the radius and the ulna. Remember I told you that the radius is on the thumb side because of rad, right? Remember rad, that BMX bike uh, movie? So here's the head of the radius. Here's the neck of the radius. You have a radial tuberosity. And the reason that all these little features are important is when you start studying the muscles, you'll have to memorize where all these muscles originate and where they insert. And they usually insert on these features, such as the radial tuberosity, ulnar tuberosity, right? So don't just skip over all this terminology. You need to really spend the time and know where these features are so that when it comes time to studying the muscles, you know where it is. Oh yeah, that's no good. That would be a dislocated radius and ulna. And yes, that is not in the anatomical position. Good for you for pointing that out. Okay, the ulna is located on the medial side of the forearm and the radius is on the lateral side. These bones are attached to each other by interosseous membrane. Very common fracture. So this you can see as an adult, right? The epiphyseal plates have closed. So here's the radius on the thumb side, rad. This is the left, right? So you can see the little indicator that says left. And here's a child, because you guys see the epiphyseal plates have not closed, and you see there's still some bone development that needs to occur. It doesn't have all his carpal bones yet. But these are green stick fractures. Okay, So remember how you break a stick and the little piece is still hanging? Well, these are green stick fractures. Okay. The eight carpal bones from the base of the hand, these are arranged into the proximal and distal rows, so you do have to know um, these. And there's a mnemonic for it, and the, the way that I remember these mnemonics is that some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Now again, I didn't make this up. Uh, my anatomy teacher uh, taught it to me. So some would be scaphoid. Lovers would be lunate, tri is triquetrium, positions is pisiform, that is trapezium, they is trapezoid, capitate is cant, and handle is the hook of the hamate. Okay. So there you go. But you definitely need to know those bones. Here's the hand. You can tell this is a right hand. This is in the anatomical position. Here's the radius, here's the ulna. So some lovers try positions that they can't handle. That's how I would identify the carpal bones here. Here's carpal bones, here's a carpal tunnel. You probably heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. It's when this nerve, the median nerve gets inflamed and there's really nowhere for it to go. So what they'll do is that they'll snip this flexor retinaculum, call it a carpal tunnel release, to give the nerve a little bit more uh, freedom to move, and that should help. Hand during gripping. Here's a loose grip, and here's a firm grip, and see where the pinky is the, the key here. So remember, I told you that and if you ever get are in a situation where you have to lose a finger, you want to lose the index, but you don't want to lose the ring and the pinky, especially the pinky, because that initiates your grip. Okay, so if you want a strong grip, you gotta have a pinky and a ring finger. And of course the thumb. Foosh. So if you ever see that on a diagnosis, that's called fall on outstretched hand. Now I know uh, this guy is not falling on his outstretched hand. He tried to, but then he landed on his face. Uh, so uh, this could be several fractures. Remember lateral mass fracture. Uh, could get a Jefferson fracture depending on how he landed first. So these are dangerous. Skateboarding is dangerous. This is a foosh fall on outstretched hand. You can break your scaphoid. You can break the surgical neck region of the humerus. And uh, same thing here. So... 
to put it all together, the pectoral girdle, incomplete girdle that contains the clavicle and scapula. You have a sternoclavicular joint, medial end of the clavicle with sternum. You have the AC joint, which is the lateral end of the clavicle with scapula. And then you have the cladal humeral joint, which is the scapula with the humerus. All in all, the upper limb contains 30 bones. The brachium, shoulder to elbow, it's humerus, also called the arm. Antibrachium, which is the forearm, that's the radius, the ulna, and then the hand, which is manus, 27 bones, including carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The radius and the ulna, proximal ends, elbow, radius has a dish-shaped head for the capitulum of the humerus. The ulna has a lecranon and trochlear notch for humerus. The ulna has a radial notch for the head of it. So it's very interesting that the ulna has a radial notch and the radius has an ulnar notch. Okay, so make sure you, you don't get confused with those terminologies. Uh, radius has a styloid process. Radius has ulnar notch for head of ulna. Here's the right hand. Again, some lovers try positions that they can't handle. All right, just there we go again. Remember, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, trapezium or trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and the hamate. Then you have the first metacarpal, second metacarpal, third, fourth, and fifth metacarpals. Then you have the proximal phalanxes. You have a distal phalanx. You have a middle phalanx on two through four, and the distal phalanx on two through five here. Here are the metacarpals, bones of the palm, base of the thumb, base of the little finger, okay? Phalanges, here's the thumb, pollux, two bones, three bones and all the others. So that's the difference between the thumb and the distal, proximal, middle, and distal. So most of the time people uh, know about arthritis in the hands and know you cannot get arthritis by cracking your knuckles. So... Um, there's no real evidence of that, but rheumatoid arthritis, now this is severe deformities of the hand, so that whenever you see a patient or someone with rheumatoid arthritis, they're gonna have severe deformities of their hand. Now remember, the difference between RA and osteoarthritis, so RA is systemic, that means they're gonna have it on both hands, whereas osteoarthritis are just, is just very terrible arthritis that usually happens in one hand, one knee, one hip, but rheumatoid arthritis will happen in both and we'll talk about rheumatoid arthritis a little bit more uh, as we go on, but I just wanted to show you this. So what's the evolution of the forearm? The human forelimb is adapted for reaching and manipulating objects. Not so long ago, we used to uh, drag them on the ground, uh, less muscular than forearm limbs of apes, but we have greater mobility than lower limb. Again, not to remember, we did not uh, evolve from apes. We had a common ancestor. So I don't, I don't want you to kind of uh, make sure that you didn't uh, get that confused there, okay? So to end this part, I wanted to show you, um, very interesting. So like I said, look at this. Primates arose from ancestors that lived in the trees of tropical forests about 65 million years ago. So you have these primates and then it starts breaking down. So look at this, from one, primate, then you're going down, you have all these, the podo, the slowers, all these evolved, right? So you can't say that you evolved from apes because look, you, chimpanzees still exist, gorillas still exist, orangutans still exist. So we had a common ancestor right here, the hominid and the hominae, and then we split off and then humans, right? So if you look at that, you can't say that you evolved from here. That's not evolution, but you actually split here from a common ancestor, and that's how humans uh, occur. Now, if you look at the, the hands, look at the, the posable thumb of man. Here's a chimpanzee, orangutan, and a baboon. So it's totally different. They can't use their thumb to write or find tasks, no fine motor skills. But humans, because of the shape of their hand, they're allowed to do that. Okay. So very interesting, right? So this is a great little thing. You can see the hands of all these primates, but really the only primates uh, and 
the species that has opposable thumb are humans.